Hello, I have chosen the topic hunting behavior because I do have a lot of clients that actually uh, have questions and problems with hunting behavior in their dogs. So we need to think a little back. Uh, try to think about 60 million years, that's a long time, but uh, still, in all these millions of years, uh, canine creatures have survived and multiplied because they could hunt and feed their families. Because food is necessary to survive. So, when they finally joined us, not so long ago, they knew perfectly well how to hunt. They were the experts on it. And it was deeply rooted in them through millions and millions of years. That's why we cannot just erase it, we cannot operate it away, we cannot train it away, but because it's a part of their personality. And that was why we started to make use of them in the beginning, to do course for us like guarding, alerting to enemies and things like that. And also because they were so much better at hunting than the humans were. They were quicker, more efficient. In difficult times, they helped us survive that way because of their skills as hunters and also guardians of the family. Hunting can be divided into three parts. It's uh, searching and tracking, finding traces of prey they can actually hunt. And when they finally get to the point of where they can see them, get them in sight, sneaking up as close as possible, and chase as a short little distance at the end. Usually they try to do that as short as possible because it's tiresome and spends a lot of energy on it and they try to avoid that. The third part is to kill the prey. Of course they had to if they were going to eat it. Most of our dogs do not have strong enough jaws to kill. Some can kill small prey, but there are not many of them who will be able to, to kill big prey. They have to be several working together to do it. They don't get very much practice in doing it either so they will not be very good at doing it. At least not one by one. And in most cases they do not want to, because our dogs, they are socialized with the people and other dogs, and their prey will be squirrels and cats and badgers and deer rabbits, stuff like that. A good hunter needs excellent senses. Quick reactions, because their prey will also be quite quick, so they have to be quick to be able to overtake them. And they need automatic reactions to movements. A dog's senses are the senses of a hunter. All species have different kind of uh, sight and different ways of using their senses, depending on what kind of 
life they are living and what kind of hunting they are doing, what kind of food they are eating. Uh, the dog has eyes to see first and foremost movements. All kind of small movements. They have a nose to follow tracks and finding scents. And they have ears to distinguish sounds. They can hear a mouse down in the ground. They can hear sounds of uh, things quite a bit away also. They have good ears. It's said that they have a hearing that's about three, four times better than ours. It probably differs a little, but uh, something around that. And these senses are also their trademark. They make the dog excellent for many types of job we can put them to and we use them for so many different tasks and of course they also give us quite a few problems in daily life and that is why i have been into this for a long time because people come and wonder what to do with this and that which are clearly related to hunting. The eyes see quickly anything that moves and it will make them interested in looking, which they do. And that is something we have to let them. The hunter will see movements. Anything that moves might be food. Our dogs probably don't think about food, but they have the same reactions to movement. Anything that moves will make the dog alert and do something about it. The eyes give the message to the brain about an interesting object and automatically trigger the dog to chase it. It is totally automatic. It's a non-willed action. They can't help it. It just happens on the spot. The moment that a, a movement is seen, the body is already in action to chase it. It is deeply rooted in the dog's nature. It can be a wagging tail. It can be any kind of vehicle that make them interested in following. Anything you throw, they will chase. Not because they love it, not because they want it. They just follow movement and it's totally automatic. Traffic, that's why so many dogs chase bicycles and cars and joggers and whatever. And of course, other dogs are moving. If one dog moves along, the others follow. A movement triggers the dog to follow that's as simple as that. It's a law of nature. You cannot punish for it. You cannot just ignore it and eliminate it. It's not possible. It's a force in the dog you have to calculate with. But you can control it. You can teach dogs alternatives. We learn how to manage it. We just have to be sure that we know that we cannot eliminate it. You, if you have a puppy, you can from the very beginning, when the dog is still a puppy or a young dog, you need 
to think about what you want the dog to do when he grows up. Do you want him to chase cars and joggers and cats and everything? Or do you not? If you want him to do it, just let him have the possibility to run for moving objects from the beginning. Let him run for sticks and balls and bicycles and chickens and cats and everything and he will be so good at doing it till you start to get annoyed by it. If you do not want your dog to chase everything as he grows up, from the beginning, you just take away the possibility for him to chase balls, sticks, and everything else. Don't throw balls. Don't throw sticks. Don't let him follow the, the kids when they run around or joggers outside the, the gate. Uh, whatever. Just take away the possibility for him to chase. Because every time you let your dog chase, he builds up skills in doing it in all kinds of situations when something moves, whatever it is. And that will cause problems. It can be physically dangerous if there is traffic around, which is often is. Also, it causes stress, which again causes other problems. And it will cause numerous of irritating and dangerous situations for people and everything else. When I lived at a farm, when uh, my little saga was uh, young, all young dogs try to chase something at some point. They like action. And once when she was around nine, 10 months old, all of a sudden, she hadn't done it before, but all of a sudden she wanted to chase a car going by. So because it was the first time that happened, I took the indication right away and started to do something about it. And that meant it very quickly was turned into something else. And she actually never chased cars again. Dogs do not need to chase to be happy. Wild animals do it only when absolutely necessary and as short as possible, seconds only. Uh, when I was um, observing wolves in Wolf Park in Indiana, it was very interesting to see this happen. Uh, they had a big herd of bison uh, out on some huge plains there. And uh, once in a while, they took uh, a group of the wolves and let them out to, to chase the bison. Don't ask me why, but that's what they did. And we were able to see one of these uh, hunting sessions. We were out uh, sitting safely on a plateau and um, in the middle of the plains and the wolves were let into the area. They did not start chasing. That's not what it happens. And it was very interesting to see. They took one look around to see what was there. And then they started to walk slowly around the whole herd to find out which one they should try to hunt. They walked slowly around the herd to keep the bison standing still because it's so much easier to hunt something that does not run away. 
they walked around slowly and then one of them was close to a calf and he went slowly up to the calf he was almost nose to nose with it and then by some miraculously small signs to the others they attacked at the same time they didn't do anything to the calf because the mother went in between and bison mothers can be quite something so that was uh, broken off but it was interesting to see how they did it they try not to waste a lot of energy by running headlessly around they try to find out what's the best way to do it go as close as possible and then attack so this is in our dogs as well and they do not need to chase to be happy instead of chasing we can let them use their other hunting skills and that is sniffing using their noses exploring searching that is the biggest part of uh, hunting anyway and they are pre-programmed to do it checking the scents in a new area till they find something of real interest searching treats alone or together finding toys and other objects checking out new objects exploring inside outside and of course following tracks that is what they are best at and that's something all dogs enjoy using the nose is what the dog is pre-programmed to do and they can do it over time they can concentrate and work over time doing it and they enjoy it it's a natural motivation you don't even need to use treats or anything they they are naturally motivated to do it and one bonus effect is the stress level goes down as soon as he start to use his nose which is a good thing so instead of stressing up the dog and make him unconcentrated and a bit uh, off limits you can make him use his nose and make the stress level go down so all dogs should do some kind of nose work that's a part of the hunting behavior that is good for them and which they all have in them that is also the kind of hunting behavior we can control to some degree and we can canalize into chosen objects and uh, as a bonus effect it is good for the dog good for concentration for lowering stress level and making them happy dogs love to follow tracks and finding things so let the dog grow up with no chasing but with lots of calm nose work that way you will actually avoid a lot of problems plus also get a dog that's less obsessed with chasing Curiosity builds confidence in coping with life in general and with all kinds of things that can otherwise be scary.
Mental stimulation using the senses develops the brain. And as such, it's also a really important thing to do because dogs need the brain just as well as we do. And then, of course, choices conquers fears. And that's the three most important ingredients for a mentally healthy dog and for a well-functioning dog with a brain. If the problem is already there, if you have a dog that has learned to chase something, we can do something about it. It takes a little bit more work, but it is absolutely possible. I've done it with many dogs and it works wonderfully. But you need to be ready to do some work about it. You need to teach the dog an alternative behavior and some good habits instead of the bad habits. If a dog is chasing cars, first we have to look at the problem and find out why, when and how if it's possible. When I got my first uh, German Shepherd, he was absolutely wonderful in chasing cars. And uh, I don't know exactly why, but uh, apparently it was one of the things he managed to do that the owners couldn't control. Because everything else he had done was controlled down to the last little bit and who likes to have a life like that. Then they very often find outlets to get their frustrations out. And it can be chasing cars or cats or squirrels and whatever, because that's the one thing that people do not seem to be able to stop. There can be other reasons. It can be high chronic stress because you are training and exercising too much. It can be a learned behavior, which is often is, I'm afraid. And other reasons, of course. That's why we need to look at what we do so we can change things because we have to change ourselves first and foremost. We have to stop re rewarding the behavior. And, and rewarding, I hope that you know how you can look upon, upon it as reward. For instance, if your dog is chasing, let's say a cat or a jogger, and you start running after him, screaming, no, 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 come here, stop that. That is rewarding the dog. He just hears your applauding and your cheering in the background, and he will only get better at it. So, that is something we have to stop doing. We have to try to find out what to do in each case. And first and foremost, the rule is take away the possibility for the dog to chase cars for a period of time. And of course, not chase anything else either, if that's a problem. We take away the possibility for him to do it. How can we do that? Uh, we can keep the dog on leash for a period of time. It's only a question of a period of time. We can walk places without cars running or whatever they usually chase. We can have so much distance that it does not trigger chasing at all. 
we have to find out what is best in each case. Dog on leash, choose where you walk. Chasing moose, take away the possibility by having the dog on a leash. This is the first part and it is to lower the stress. Three to six weeks of taking away the possibility is the start of building up a new and better habit and alternative behavior. It can take much shorter, but you have to realize that it might take that long. Then comes the next part, and that is finding alternatives. And it can be, for instance, follow you instead of the car, moose, or whatever. That is often my favorite, because that's easy to manage when you're out with a dog to make him follow you. You can also teach him the alert, telling you about the car he has seen. That is very efficient, but that's a little bit more complicated training. It can be some other kind of job also, but the, my first choice would be follow me instead of the car. It's uh, partly because it's very simple to do, it's easy to teach, and it can be used in numerous situations. I did that with my German Shepherd so when I realized what a fab fabulous chaser of cars he was, I started to work with him and he was a bit extreme. So I had to do it really well planned. He was on a leash when there were cars in the area. It could be as far away as one kilometer but he had to be on a leash then because he would hear the engine and he would go for it. So, sorry, I go a little bit fast here. So uh, the, the next was to also take him into the forest to let him far away, many kilometers into the forest. So we can be a bit off leash. And then I started to teach him every time he saw or heard an engine in the distance, follow me instead. It worked wonderfully. It took some weeks, yes, but it functioned and he learned. In the beginning, you might have to teach the dog to alert to a smacking sound. So you can, when he see an engine, a car in the distance, you can make the smacking sound. Or another easy sound that can always be used and make him turn and follow you. When you teach a smacking sound for attention, you smack. You treat immediately for a quick association, repeat just two, three times. And the second step, you smack, walk two steps away. And he will follow because he's learned already to pay attention. He's not going to look you in the eyes. He's just going to follow where you are going. As you see with my dog here, you just see where my legs are turning. Next steps will be walk a few steps more, change direction, walk longer, change now and then, smack to get the dog away from something. Gradually the treats fade away. I, I never use treats on 
an ordinary walk. It is only in the beginning of the training. If the dog is interested in something else, you wait for the dog, you smack and make him follow you. You can make the dog follow you past people, cars, etc. by using that smacking sound. Start with a distance and get closer and closer till you can actually walk along the highway, like here. Use it to get the dog out of trouble of many kinds. To you change your position to show you the dog where you are going and he will follow. To pass cars, getting the dog down from the bench or sofa, etc. Crossing the street and instead of chasing cars, looking at the car, then following the owner. This was my little saga that uh, the day before had tried to chase a car. And I started to teach her right away that when you see a car, you can look, that is okay, but then you follow me. And this is actually the next day. And I could already have her off leash when we walked along the highway because she learned very quickly. It hadn't been a habit yet. So she was looking and then she was following me. It's good to look at cars, but it's only for looking, not for chasing. The goal should be that the dog looks at the cars, turns and follows you always without any help because it will be an automatic reaction instead of chasing. Alternatives can also be, for instance, if your dog is chasing squirrels up in the tree or birds, you teach him to track or search something on the ground instead. If a dog is obsessed with the deer tracks or rabbits, make him learn to find family members instead. Some incompatible jobs to the bad habit. Just remember that obedience does not work. You might get control at the moment by making the dog sit, stay, down, stay or whatever, but he will not learn to cope by himself. As soon as you do not have the control of the dog in a situation, he will chase anyway. We want the dog to learn for life. By teaching the dog an alternative, he has something to do instead of the unwanted behavior and he will continue doing it. You cannot change something with nothing. And that's a good living rule. It's the same with people also. Take away something from somebody, you have to give them something else instead. You just cannot stop one behavior without giving the dog a chance of doing something else. So, do not chase that car, follow me instead. And following you should be something they like to do, hopefully. And do not chase the flies and birds in the air. Search the ground for something instead. Do not start tracking for that deer or moose. 
go tell your owner about it instead. That is what we call alerting. There are also other tools we can use. The easiest and most simple things to use will always be the best. Too often I see trainers who make things so complicated that people cannot do it and dogs cannot do it. Make it simple. We have other tools to use in many situations and one is the universal hand signal. That is, if you do not teach your dog anything else in this world, teach him the hand signal and teach yourself to use the hand signal. Why it works, nobody knows, but it does work. Very few people seem to find it difficult to work, but then they do it in some complicated way. Almost all the people I've been training up through the years, they have been able to do it when they were learning to do it properly. All mammals, including the human species, respond to the stopping hand signal. First, use it in daily situations when the dog is not very stressed. Examples, you are sitting in your living room and then you want to move around the room, but you don't want the dog to jump up and move too. So, just give the hand signal before you start moving. Hand signal, start moving. And if the dog is a little bit alert, then just keep the hand there a little longer when you are moving. That's okay. Hand signal, then get up from the chair. You can use it when the dog starts reacting to sounds outside, telling the dog, don't bother, this is okay. When he gets interested in food on the table and you just want to tell him it's not for him, don't get irritated or angry and start shouting, go lie down or something. It is so much nicer and quieter and so much understandable for the dog when you just use the hand signal. Like here, we were sitting in the garden and my dog came, of course, to see what was on the table and that's okay. I'm nothing against that. I often share with my dogs at the table, but this time there was nothing for him, so I gave him the hand signal and he just turns away and walks away. Simple, quiet, pleasant, and that's all it needs to be. If the dog wants to bark at the doorbell or people visiting, you can use the hand signal. Use it as early as possible in a situation when he starts a hunting behavior or any other behavior you do not want at the moment. For instance, I was taking one of my horses up from the field and I had a visiting dog that day and that dog was quite good at barking, to be quite honest. So I knew he was going to bark at my horse when I passed. So. As soon as he could see us, I gave him the hand signal and kept the hand there so he shouldn't forget himself. And he actually didn't say a word. That's how the hand signal works. Different tools for different situations. Hand signal, going in between splitting up 
curving and keeping a distance. Depending on what your dog is chasing, you can choose one or more of these tools. They will also be great helpers in daily lives when it comes to other problems like guarding, reacting to things, being afraid of things, etc. Just remember the basic rules when you want to change a behavior. Take away the possibility to react. Teach a dog an alternative, something else. But it also has to do with management, of course, uh, which is your responsibility, the whole dog's life. If you put the dog in situations where he's old instincts are free to blossom, that is your own fault. Management means do not put your dog in a situation that is too difficult for the dog to handle. If you let your dog run around with no supervision, he will chase when something is moving. You can teach him something else, but then he has to have the possibility to do it. If you close the doors and the dog is out in the garden alone and he cannot get to you, then of course he has no chance of doing an alternative instead. He will follow that trail of an animal if there's nobody there to tell him that I don't think so, follow me instead. If you want the dog to get different habits, good habits, you need to be there supervising and guiding him. We do the same with our kids. We don't let them grow up doing exactly what they want. You know, some years ago, they had a test going in England. They had a bunch of 11-year-old uh, kids, which they placed in the house. And they were going to deal with uh, living there alone without any adult supervising them. You should think that normal kids would be able to manage. But they were on their own. Nobody to tell them what to do and what not to do. No supervision at all. After two days, they had destroyed the whole house and they were about to injure each other, almost killing each other. So they had to call off the whole, the whole arrangement. Young specimens, young kids, young dogs, young any kind of species, they need supervision from the adult ones to tell them what they can do, what they are supposed to do, and how they are going to behave. That goes for our kids, that goes for our dogs. Our dogs do not have adult dogs to supervise them usually, so we have to do it. That's our job. If you want a dog to stop chasing, you have to teach him an alternative. That's your job. If you want him to have less interest in following tracks of mice, rabbits, whatever, you give him something else to follow. For instance, man trailing, finding lost dogs or cats or other animals, 
finding injured animals, all kind of things like that. And as we talked about, if he's obsessed with something in the air, make him search something on the ground. You have to change to another channel and give him an alternative you can control in the beginning. Example, a beagle has his nose glued to the ground for rabbits. What can you teach him to do instead? Anything that triggers his curiosity. And I repeat the rules again because I cannot repeat it often enough. Take away the possibility for the dog to do the unwanted behavior. Teach him an alternative. Practice it regularly and consequently till it has become a habit. Unfortunately, if the hunting has been allowed for a long time, has become an obsession and a real well-established bad habit, it might be difficult to get rid of it without work. It, it takes a lot of work and energy and planning. And you need to be consistent and stubborn. That can be difficult for some people. And that is understandable, of course. But maybe you can get help from somebody who can guide you through the work. Depends on how important it is for you and how necessary it will be to change a dog's habit. When my German Shepherd was chasing cars, I couldn't have it like that because he couldn't be free anywhere. He would chase an engine miles away if he had the possibility. But he learned. He learned that he could follow me instead for, of chasing cars. And when he had learned it, I never had to remind him of it. He did it the rest of his life and I had never any problem with it. So, theoretically, it's possible to do it, but you need to be aware of the work it includes. So, then the example of Star, who was a world champion in chasing cars. He was one and a half when I started the training. Took away the possibility to chase walked him safely away from cars. In this case, I actually used about 300 meters a field close to the farm and walking slowly back and forth. It's important to make them walk or do something physically because they will be a little stressed in that situation. And stress means that their muscles get energy and it's easier to try to do it. So make them walk slowly, but walk. And when a car turned up in sight, he was allowed to look and I made him the smacking signal, change direction and make him follow me away from the road. Just wait till the dog comes, don't fuss. If he stands looking for a while, okay, let him look. He needs to see what's going on. And also make the training quite short in the beginning. If you can make him turn away from one or two cars in the beginning, that's enough. Then the stress will get higher and higher for every car and then you will get to the point where you will react and launch at the car anyway. So do it short in the beginning and do it a little longer and a little longer as you go on with the training. So step by step a little closer, longer training sessions, 
but be sure he's calm and copes on each step step before you moving on. Ten months after I started the training, I could easily walk him off leash along the highway. He just threw a glimpse at the cars passing and then followed me. He could also walk around off leash at a friend's farm with a busy highway running past the entrance. He just did not bother about the cars at all anymore. For the rest of his life, he was completely safe around cars. He never ever chased a car again the rest of his 13 years of age. He was not the only one I've done this with, but um, it was a very good example because it was a bit extreme. I never had to say or do anything when he had learned it. He did it. I could trust him 100%. Was it worth the work? Oh, yes, it was. So much better for me, for the dog and for everybody. Hunting behavior is strong in dogs. But we can handle it by management, training alternatives, and get the necessary knowledge about how it works. As I say, an ounce of precaution is worth a pound of cure. So starting with a puppy or a young one is the best, of course, and in much, much easier. Uh, Saga learned it in one day. Star took eight to nine months to do it properly. So there you have the difference between taking it quickly from the beginning or waiting till it's a well-established bad habit. So if a cure is needed because of obsessive hunting, it can still be done, but it needs more work planning and energy than if you start with the young one. But always remember people that hunting is a normal behavior for a dog. And that is for all dogs. Some do not hunt so much that it is a big problem. A pecking is wouldn't really bother me if they had the idea of hunting. But uh, they all have it in them in some way. Using punishments and anger, what dogs would look upon as aggression, is both unfair and unethical. They are hunters by birth. We have to plan what we do so it does not become dangerous to the dog or the environment. And obsession is also very stressful for the dog. Stress is unhealthy. It goes both on the mental side and the physical side of the dog and it's not good at all. Remember that dogs are born pack animals and as such they are so good at cooperating and they do cooperate with us if we plan it that way and let them do it instead of commanding them. Choose the right breed for you. As I said, all breeds have it in them in some way, but some breeds are quicker in reacting to moving objects. They are also maybe bigger and faster and can do a lot of more trouble than maybe others. If you have a Dalmatian or a Husky, 
they will be much, much quicker than, for instance, uh, some kind of mastiff. They often cannot be bothered to run fast. Or if it is a uh, Pekingese or a Pomeranian, they are not so dangerous as a big and fast dog can be. We are all different. And if by personality you do not like to work consequently, you should have breeds that is easier to, to uh, guide and supervise so they don't hunt unnecessary. If you prefer a relaxed life, you should choose a calmer breed, of course. If you are physically not very strong, you should stay with uh, some smaller and easier dogs. Think about how you are and don't go into the trap like so many people do. I have had many clients up through the years that have been desperate. One little lady, she was only 150 tall and she had a big male Bernice dog. And when he wanted to go somewhere, she had no chance of making him go the other way. He just went and she had to be dragged along. Of course, she can learn to handle it, learn to train him. But uh, if they really want, you have no chance. Think a little about what you are like and choose a breed that goes better together with your, your personality. You can also think about other things. A beagle, who is the most extreme tracking dog of all, he cannot walk around free on a farm without supervision 24-7. Then you have a problem. He will start tracking and following tracks of all kinds of animals in the forest. A border collie with quick reactions to sounds and movements should not live beside a kindergarten and be alone out in the garden so he gets upset by the kids all the time, etc. etc. It's a it's about thinking a little what we're doing. Make a plan. Be the role model your dog needs. And if necessary, start working with the problem. 